looks like we are at time. Hello, everybody. Hopefully you're in the right session. Um, if, if, you know, look at the elephant hat. If you're not here to talk about elephants and all things elephant related, you probably are in the wrong session, um, but you're, you're welcome anyways. Uh, so we're here to talk about the, well, I originally titled this seven deadly postgres, you know, mistakes. And then as time went on, it just continued to grow. So now it's 10 ish, maybe 11, depending on what you count. So, um, you know, we do have a few extras in there because we're all about giving you extreme value during your presentations. So uh, let us introduce ourselves. I'm Matt Yakovitz. I'm head of open source strategy at Percona or the Hoss. Um, I get to do all the fun community things. Um, we do have a podcast called the Hoss's Talks Foss. If you're interested in hearing more about open source databases, Postgres, we also do a Postgres meetup once a month, uh, which is virtual. So if you want to attend that, I'd encourage you to do it. And this is my co-speaker, Barrett. Yep, I am Barrett Chambers. I'm the Senior Manager of Solutions Engineering at Percona. Um, I support all of our technology, so MySQL, Postgres, and Mongo, and my team. Um, we are hiring, so if you're interested, please let me know. <laughs> Always the shameless plug at these conferences, right? Um, everybody, you know, is hiring nowadays. So um, we're going to talk about some of the problems that we see over and over again. And how I started this presentation was I was talking with our support engineers, and I asked them what they're seeing consistently over and over again from users out in the field who are using PostgreSQL um, in a uh, production environment. And so they provided me this handy dandy data to break down some of where they see the most common issues. Now, this is how they categorize them. So, um, you know, there could be other categories or subcategories in here, um, but you can see that there's quite a bit on the, um, come on in, yes, come on, it's plenty of room. Um, you can see that there's a lot on the configuration setup, installation, upgrade type of, you know, uh, problems. You also see that there's a lot of tuning and monitoring in HA replication. And of course, security backups, bug crashes. But if that was going to be my entire presentation, it would be boring. So I don't want to do that. I want to go into a little bit in depth into what those are and what those look like. So we're going to count down, okay? Just like the old David Letterman thing. So the number 10 most common mistake. So um, how do you use this, right? So how, how do you use this tool? How do you use this? And obviously, this is really all about the tool selection and how you are using the tools that are available to you in Postgres SQL. Now, um, this is an example of one of the awesome you know, things about the Postgres environment. There are many tools to do very similar things, and you can find a tool to do almost any purpose. But there is overlap between these tools, and a lot of times, you'll get some benefits out of one tool that won't exist in another. And so people will start to combine tools or they'll start to use the wrong tool and think they're getting something they're not. A good example of this is PG Bouncer versus PG Pool versus HA Proxy. All of them can do similar activities, but not all of them do the same activities. So if you're looking for things like, you know, load balancing or um, uh, uh, proxy server, or you're looking to uh, do connection pooling, it might be a little different depending on your use case. And so what we'll see is a lot of people choose the tools that they think are really important to them or that they think will solve the job, but they don't understand the tools and they deploy them incorrectly. Uh, this is something that you have to watch out for. Even the most popular packages like PG Repack um, has some you know, crazy things that you can do and not do. Um, and so you know, as you go through that, you'll see that you know, a tool that's widely used like PG Repack um, has some weirdness with locking. If you use it the wrong way, you can actually cause things to block on your system. Now we have a blog on you know, that particular tool, but as you deploy tools, they're here to make your job easier, but that doesn't mean that every tool will make your job easier if it's deployed incorrectly. So watch out for that. Now, number nine is the I secured my database. Now, I don't know how many people secure their database like this, but judging by the news, it's an awful lot of people, right? Because how many people out there, you know, see database, you know, breaches in the news almost once a week? It happens so frequently, it's not funny. Um, fun fact, number one problem for database breaches um, in Mongo and Elastic is not setting a password. So you would think that that would be kind of default logic, but no, no, let's just leave that set up as default. Um, so have you secured your database like this? If so, you might have a few leaky holes in your security system. So we want to avoid that. So there, there's a few things that we do see 
Um, you know, obviously there's some best practices like using SSL uh, to encrypt traffic. Um, you know, opening up the Unix socket parameter uh, is, is another one where people will, you know, give permissions that they don't uh, want to. Uh, over granting permission. So, you know, creating a user and giving them access to do everything and everything because the application might need it. That happens quite a bit as well. Um, not understanding how to, you know, set up the authentication as well. Uh, now, I don't know, a lot of people don't set up auditing. And so just because you have some security measures in place doesn't mean you don't have to go back and figure out if someone did breach or how to figure that out. So um, those are just some of those best practices. Yeah, so I dug through the Postgres 14 release notes, all the blog posts, benchmarking, and I'm peppering in the cool features that we see in Postgres 14. And I'm telling you whether they address some of these problems um, that exist that Matt's going through in our top 10 list. So uh, lack security practices, what's coming? Um, we do have a change to the default authentication method to a more secure method that should help with out of the box security. But as Max said, it's kind of a thing where you need to keep exploring it. So while that will help some people, that's not going to help everybody. Um, and we do have more predefined roles as well. Um, so you have PG read all data and PG write all data. Um, but as he was just discussing, be careful with giving those permissions. Um, and cool thing about these is as you're adding new tables, um, if you're using one of these predefined roles, the user will automatically gain read or write access to those newly created tables. So that's a bit of an interesting thing. Yeah, and it's a quality of life thing in that case, because you know, if you've ever had to go through and grant permissions on, you know, new tables as they're created, and it's just, it gets kind of oppressive if you have large systems with lots of uh, structures. So, yeah, so spoiler alert, the verdict on all these is going to be maybe, like, you need to make sure that these changes are actually relevant to your workload, um, and it doesn't mean you can abandon other practices as well. So number eight, um, I don't know if any of you have kids, but, uh, you know, my daughter, she's 20 and her room still looks like the one on the left or right in your face um, quite often. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, hey, you know, clean up after yourself because if you're not cleaning up after yourself, you know, you're, you're gonna leave not only a messy room but it's gonna be really hard to walk around. But a lot of people think, you know, hey, it's just gonna get dirty again, right? So why not just leave it dirty? And of course, we're talking about the loved vacuum features within PostgreSQL. Of course, the proper use of vacuum is going to help or hurt your system. And so this is kind of one of these interesting you know, debates. And if you're not familiar with vacuum, um, it does clean up some of the dead space. It does re-optimize and organize your, your structures. But uh, Postgres has had auto vacuuming in it for a while, which is going to clean those up, uh, optimize things. But a lot of people don't realize they can tune how often that automatically changes and how that automatically runs. Some people like to push that off as long as possible and they do so at their own peril. Let's be honest, uh, there are other issues that you can run into uh, that can cause some significant issues if you do push those off. But you do have some fine grained control where you can tune what's working when. Um, leaving them as default could work if you have a relatively small database, but as your data grows, uh, you probably are going to have some issues with that. So are you using auto vacuum? What sort of settings? Understanding what they do. Um, using PG Repack, for instance, could be another alternative. I mentioned that as a tool um, and you should uh, check that out if you haven't, if you are worried about trying to optimize and clean up things. So there's a lot of things that you should look at from a vacuum perspective to make sure things are set up and uh, running. And so we see this quite often where we're either seeing locking issues or slowdowns that appear to be kind of random noise, but they really are because either things haven't been optimized or a vacuum got kicked off at the worst possible time, which generally seems to happen, right? So whenever you don't want those maintenance operations to happen, the automatic ones just happen to happen. Not good. Yeah, so what's coming to help address this? This is a problem we see with some of our larger customers with a high number of transactions. Um, so there's improvements to a process called compactify tuples, um, which will help with the vacuum process itself and is resulting in performance improvements in initial testing. So this should impact a large majority of users um, as this process happens automatically. So that's a pretty good initial improvement, 25% too. It is. Yeah. So, I mean, the quarter improvement, that's pretty solid. So, so I think. I mean, it's still a maybe, but it should affect most people. Yeah, I, th I, think it should, yeah. I think it could be pretty good there. All right, so if you have a couple, more is better, right? 
right? Isn't that the case? It's, it's always the case. So um, there's no, no such thing as too much, which in the case of connections is wrong. Um, so poor connection management is actually a significant cause of slowdowns and resource consumption within Postgres. So uh, Postgres model uh, has a, a different model than some of the other databases. They have a, a new process created with additional memory uh, for each connection, which means that you can consume quite a bit of memory. So if you look at, um, you know, you could get two megs to 50 megs per, you know, connection. And so connection pooling and load balancing, especially at scale, is an absolutely critical thing. Um, if you're going to run, you know, hundreds of thousands of connections, it's something that isn't a recommendation. It's really a requirement in modern systems. And a lot of people don't do that. And so they end up wasting a lot of memory and duplicated um, uh, memory files. Yes, so what's coming to help with poor connection management? Um, there are optimizations that have been implemented to improve connection management, and you can see this in this trend line with some initial benchmarking. You'll notice much the same for smaller number of concurrent connections, but as we increase those, um, you're seeing a, a pretty significant gap in terms of performance in, in Postgres 14, and this is because of optimizations that have made to the connection management process. Yeah, and it's it's interesting to see that, you know, it's, you know, you, you start to see the diversion around 80 to 100. Yeah. Right. So you, you start to see that that's where those uh, features start to take effect and improve. And the improvement isn't massive, but that can make a huge difference um, in larger scale systems. Yeah. And this one's a maybe because at if you're if you're already at a point where you have a high number of concurrent connections and it's impacting your workload, you probably already explored things like PG Pool, who may be improving this already. Um, and if you're at a low number of concurrent connections, that you're not really going to see any performance improvements from this. So th this one's definitely a maybe. So how many people think the default config was made by really smart people and they shouldn't touch it? Well, I think there's actually quite a few people. So um, leaving the default settings is something that happens way too often. Um, and here's the thing. Postgres is not tuned out of the box for your specific workload. It's really a very generic, very basic workload. Right. And so there's a few recommendations that we always recommend, and we'll throw some of these out here during this talk here, you know, effective cache size to 50 to 75 percent shared buffers, buffer pools, you know, a quarter to a third of this total system memory, uh, work memory about 10, 10 megs, um, set those auto vacuum settings like I mentioned. Right. So these are all things that are going to impact your performance and, you know, how things are going in the system. Um, and so I think that these are all, you know, good uh, things to check. Same thing with wall settings. Um, if you're not familiar with wall, uh, wall, think checkpointing in MySQL or um, other databases. Uh, but this is a huge, huge problem if you don't have those set uh, for high write load systems. So you're going to want to make sure that you uh, address those. Also logging and debugging. The worst time to try and turn on a log is after a problem happened. So make sure that you know what you're logging and how often you are, because if you need that you know, uh, troubleshooting and, you know, digging in, that's going to be really important. Um, so, oh, we don't have any uh, uh, default anything. config, you know, and I guess there isn't anything. So my question to you uh, in the audience is how many people are over or unders? Or, oh, is, there, is, that is, that is that an over? Is that an over? Is that an over? Oh, over. Under. Oh, under. Oh, we got, a, we, got, we got a little bit of everything. Hang on, quiz before you go next. Yeah, does anyone know what this will be related to on the Postgres side? Yeah, does anybody have any guess on what I'm talking about here, wh why it relates to Postgres? Starbucks gift card? No? For, for a guess? Oh. You don't have to be right? Oh, okay, well, all right. <laughs> all right, well, then, then we'll, we'll just go. It, we're talking about over or under indexing, okay? So over and under. Of course, that's what we're talking about. Now it's so obvious if you rather are you over or under. Um, so, you know, indexes are good, but too much of a good thing is also bad and too little of a good thing is bad as well. Um, every index you add will create some overhead in maintaining and managing that index. So when I mentioned, for instance, vacuuming, those indexes need to be cleaned up and holes, you know, cleaned up as well. Um, but every column doesn't need an index. So you can back off from the number of indexes, but the ones that you're using frequently totally should. And there are different types of indexes for different types of workload. Uh, Postgres has a very, very rich group of indexes. And so picking the right index for the right sort of workload is really important. 
And you can see what indexes are being used and how frequently they're being used by looking at PGSTAT all indexes or PGSTAT IO all indexes. So it's, a, it's an easy way to take a look and see what's being used, what isn't. So you can see if you can drop some of those, maybe you know, uh, get a little bit more perform performance back or uh, a little bit more disk space. Yeah, so we do have performance improvements coming for this problem over and under indexing. Um, so as Matt was explaining, um, you know, indexes can cause bloat within the database. Um, and when a vacuum is run, um, dead tuples are removed. Um, so when that happens, a page split occurs. This is terrible for performance. So improvements in PG14 have made it so dead tuples can be detected and removed before the vacuum process even happens. Um, so that should result in less page splits. It's essentially delaying your problem, but um, you know, it, it, it'll help with performance. So yes, maybe. Maybe, of course, <laughs> you're just, just maybe everything. I don't wanna say yes. All right, so let's add this extension. I may need it later. How many people have used Postgres ext extensions in their database? Okay, quite a few. How many have put in Postgres extensions and then never really used them and just left them? It happens way more frequently than you would like. And this is a classic blunder of all time. Of course, we're talking about this extensibility model. Extensions are wonderful. But here's the thing, extensions, especially from unreliable sources or things that are out in the ecosystem, they can make your database do wonderful and really wild and unwonderful things at the same time. Um, a lot of times when we find a performance issue or we find a bug, one of the first things we recommend is what extensions do you have? Can you disable them? Right? Um, because that is typically one of those culprits that you're going to find code quality is going to vary so much from extension to extension. So stick with the reliable sources. Um, make sure that if you do have, you know, something that is mission critical, is there support available for some vendor for it? Um, you know, how are you going to fix it if there is a problem? Um, and if you do have those weird problems, take a look at what extensions are installed. And that's probably a good place to just say, like, can I disable a couple and see if the weird problem goes away? Uh, and, and I've had this just recently where I was crashing a Postgres system with a uh, beta quality uh, extension and you know hey it was like oh my god what is it and turn it off and everything works and it's like oh well huh, that's a bug that i need to go you know file uh, so you want to make sure you do that that's a snowball problem too it might not seem like a big deal at first but eventually the snowball is huge and you're like what is this doing what is that doing and we've seen it with some of our larger customers they can't even i'll ask them i'll be like what is this doing for you guys and they're like we don't know i'm like well who would know and they're like he left it's like okay <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's just install all the extensions and then later on we'll figure out what we need. Don't do that. All right. So how many people think they can outrun outages? Surprisingly, there was like 20 something percent that, you know, had backup and HA problems. Um, and there are a lot of people who think that they can outrun the outage. Um, and so missing an action backup and HA strategies, um, you know, backup and HA are two separate things that's important to know. Um, and, you know, people often assume that one will cover the other, and this is not the case. So I can give you case after case where, you know, we have seen major companies fail because of something as simple as not having an appropriate backup. Um, I worked with a, a, a company a while ago where we got a call, you know, and they're like, oh, we need help. Our database crashed. Um, and it turns out that they switched data centers. When they switched data centers, they forgot to turn on backups in the new data center. The backups running in the old data center that didn't have any new data going to it. They went for like a month, didn't realize it. Somebody dropped a table. So they had failover, so they could fail over between the two like systems uh, that were local, but because they replicated the drop table, guess what happened? No data. So they had to go to a backup, which didn't exist. So both are incredibly important and you have to tune your environment and choose what you're looking for. Are you looking for something that's gonna come up really soon or are you gonna try and protect your data or both? Um, and, you know, it's so critical for you to test your backups once in a while to make sure they're actually working, right? Um, and that's a problem that occurs, you know, quite frequently. Um, also with backups, um, wall settings, so that checkpointing, you know, people will delay it often and they'll make these giant, giant wall files um, that can cause performance issues, that can cause recoverability issues. So for instance, if you uh, decide to fail over or a system crashes, you have to come up, you have to replay logs that haven't been uh, fully applied. That can take a really long time. So that's something that I would recommend against. Um, so also think about your backup retention policies, 
think about how what your strategy is for that and make sure you implement that um, across all of your systems. Oh. All right, wrong yes. button. So help is coming for this. That should increase uh, RTO objectives for customers. Whoa. And the exciting thing about this is it's the same thing that I talked about earlier. It's this compactify tuples process. It's also a part of the crash recovery process within Postgres. So it's used by the vacuum process and by the recovery process. Um, so it, it takes care of compactification um, during the recovery process. Um, and it, uh, it this new improvement eliminates the need for what was previously used, a queue sort process. So there's a blog post that's really long that goes into exactly um, what improvements were made, but high level um, crash recovery should happen faster because they removed an inefficient process that was happening. Um, and some initial benchmarking that's been shown is um, crash recovery can be about two and a half times faster, which is very significant when you're talking about like, you know, 15 minutes versus 10 minutes shorter than that. I don't, I don't do math, so maybe five. <laughs> Um, yes, yes. <laughs> Five minutes is shorter than 15. Is there any doubt on that? I mean, we can have a debate if we really want. So your answer is maybe again. Well, Mr. Maybe. It is maybe. It is. But it, this one's leaning more towards a yes. More towards a yes. Yeah. Okay. So number two. Does anybody have a guess on this one? So here's the thing. Um, not all workloads are the same. I'm sure if you turn to your left or your right, you'll see someone in this room. And I guarantee you that they are probably running a completely different workload than you are, even if they're running the exact same application, right? So this is one of those things that you could have the exact same thing running in two different locations. And, you know, you have two different workloads because your users are different. You know, people are doing different things with the database. The application has different use cases. You know, two, no two WordPresses are the same. No two, you know, uh, CMSs are the same, even if they have a, a very basic, you know, setup. So um, you have to understand that that workload is going to differ. And tuning the database for your specific workload and every application will have a specific workload is important. So how do you do that? So one of the things is you have to understand your workload and do some performance analysis. There's some things you can look at uh, some of the internal uh, views within Postgres. You can look at like PG statements. You can look at you know some of the, the metrics there. Um, we have uh, for our observability and analysis, we have tools like uh, Procona Monitoring and Management for Insight. So we can look at graphs and charts and what's happening. Um, but you want to start to understand what your latency looks like. How many people here have heard of P99 latency? Oh, a few people, not, not everybody, but okay. So P99 latency, basically what you want to do is throw out the 1% outliers and you want to look at the 99% where most of your users are um, on the system. So you're going to look at how long it takes for queries to run, how long for response time to happen on your website, you know, what sort of things can you, can you look at there? And that P99 latency is really important. You want to tune for that. You want to get rid of that outlier, right? Because if you've got one thing that takes 24 hours to run and everything else, you know, takes, you know, uh, sub second, the 24 hour one you want to fix, but it's the other ones that are going to have more impact on your users potentially. So how often does that workload change? Understanding the cycles of your business and how that impacts your application and your database is super critical and important. Um, great example of this is tax season, right? Think about tax season. Accountants are super busy for like two months out of the year and then like their traffic goes down. I uh, did some work for a company that uh, basically does testing for certification for accountants, lawyers, different you know things that require annual certification. And every year there's a certification period for everyone. And during that certification period, it was insanely busy. The rest of the year, they could basically take the system offline for days and no one would notice. So how that workload changes will dictate quite a bit, not only what you're tuning the database for, but what you're setting up the application for. Um, and there's some other things that you can do for that, you know, read, write, splitting, you know, um, how are you gonna, you know, segregate, you know, different types of traffic, things like that. Going along with that though, is not tuning the system for the workload, all right? Now, you know, when we talk about system tuning, you know, you've got the database. So the database configuration options, you've got, you know, your application configuration options, but from the system itself, you know, if you're running a Linux system, there are a ton of other things that you can look at. So you want to look at how the memory is being consumed, what you're using there. You're going to want to adjust uh, based on um, 
your workload again. You, you didn't have anything for that one. So, so I'm, I need to have you talk more. <laughs> All right, so um, you know, number one, that our number one problem that we see, um, any guesses based on the pictures, um, what the number one problem that we see over and over again, um, and, and I, can, I can tell you it is poor database design. Okay, so I went and I talked with, um, uh, I did a road show a couple of years ago and talked with different developers and uh, asked them, you know, hey, or actually different infrastructure teams. And I asked them, what is the biggest problem that you see with your databases? How can we help you? What, what can we do to make things easier? And, and you know what they said? Um, I'm sorry if you're a developer in here, they go, it's developers. Oh my God, they throw code over the wall. We've never seen it. We don't know what's going on. And then all of a sudden it gets into production and it breaks everything. So, you know, that's not necessarily a developer problem or a database problem, but it is the number one problem that we see that continually bites people in the rears, right? And these are small changes that can have a massive impact on your infrastructure and your system. Um, we've been doing this demo in the booth where we've uh, got PMM running and we've got this arcade control and we have all these buttons and switches. And one of the switches changes the types of uh, data types that we're using. So one is a numeric versus a bar chart. So a lot of applications, for instance, they'll use a, a UUID, so a 32 character field for a primary key. That is a road to performance ruin because using a var char for a primary key often will have unintended consequences. Your index, your lookups then have to process a 32 character field as opposed to a four byte integer. It's a massive performance difference. MySQL, it's a little bit bigger than Postgres, but we're still talking a, you know, in a lot of cases, five, 10, 15 X difference in performance at scale. So that is a huge, huge issue. And it's a, such a small thing that it's often overlooked. So you want to make sure you choose the right types of uh, uh, data structures as well. Um, that poor schema design or designing an application that doesn't you know, scale is also a big concern. Um, probably a lot of people here, uh, their applications rely on JSON. Um, anybody here storing just raw JSON in the database and querying against it? Okay, well, you know, we've got a couple people. Um, so I did some benchmarks on this. I did a blog just recently on that. And you know what, there's some great tools and databases, but there are some huge performance limitations if you use that as your primary query storage, right? So breaking out some of those um, objects is important. Um, also using things like, you know, functional indexing or generated columns um, can make a huge difference on your performance in those types of cases. So it's just little tiny things that can make a huge, huge difference. Okay, and over-reliance on ORM frameworks. So I don't know if anybody's using any ORMs, whether it's Ruby on Rails or uh, SQL Alchemy or you know, uh, these other tools, they make querying easy, they make accessing databases easy, but a lot of times they'll make poor decisions. They might do things that seem suboptimal to someone looking out for performance. So just because it works out of the box doesn't necessarily mean that it is a good work out of the box. Right? So we have to be very careful on that. Um, the other, it's an interesting thing, and this could be another over under one, I could have used this for this, uh, is the undersized versus oversized hardware. So I have worked with both people in the past, and I know that there are some people who they, I've talked to executives and they'll, then they'll say to me, they'll go, I want the biggest AWS box they have. And you'll be like, but you're running like 30 queries a second. I don't care because I know that eventually I'm gonna use it. And I don't wanna to have to worry about it later. That's a lot of wasted money, right? So that, that oversized you know, hardware oftentimes will lead to you know, unintended consequences. Same thing with the undersized, obviously. So a lot of people, they'll click the button, they'll add an instance into you know, their favorite cloud provider, and then they'll just leave it there and they'll never look at it and they'll wonder why their application's not performing. Uh, something to keep in mind there. Um, we are all digital pack rats now as well. So if, if, if you, 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 you haven't heard, you know, data is the new gold, they say, it's the new oil, whatever you want to call it. And nobody wants to get rid of data because in the future, you might need it. And so systems are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know what? That's at the expense of, you know, performance. That's the, at the expense of scale. 
And so storing more data without having a thought on how to make use of it is an incredibly problematic trend that we're seeing. Now the bonus round here, this is the bonus round. It kind of goes in with that database design. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about database design problems, um, this is not necessarily a database design problem because this car actually works. So it works, but I would argue that it isn't the most efficient design of a car. I mean, I don't know, maybe you guys think it is, uh, you know, you, you folks, you know, like, you know, you can tell me, but, you know, a, a really common issue, and this was kind of a late addition because somebody came to me and said like, oh my God, you have to mention this because, you know, this, is, this happens so often, is um, really smart people often do really dumb things. And, you know, it's that over-engineering, you know, the systems to the point where they actually become really brittle. Okay. And so when you're dealing with incredibly complicated architectures, when you're adding in all of those extensions that I mentioned, and you're adding in all this HA technology, and you're trying to overcome the issues that exist, um, oftentimes that will have a cascading problem impact. And it will often cause all kinds of other issues that you might not be aware of. Okay. Yeah. So summary of all the... Uh interesting or exciting enhancements that I pulled out of the, the Postgres release notes and benchmarks that people were doing and early reports of using Postgres 14. Um, to me, the most exciting is the Compactify tuples improvements, which affect both crash recovery and the vacuum process, which are both headaches for a lot of our customers. Um, dead tuple detection between vacuum processes um, to avoid those page splits, which tank your performance. You can, as Matt was saying, you can come by our booth and, and run a vacuum process on our imaginary workload. Um, so yeah, come by our booth. You can run a vacuum process on our IMDB workload and see exactly what it does to your queries per second, your CPU. Um, improved connection management, that's another one, a headache we see. There are a lot of tools to address that already, um, but getting that natively into Postgres is gonna help a lot of people. Um, and then there's default security improvements as well, which are always exciting um, out of the box uh, security measures. But all of these essentially do not allow you to ignore all the things that, that Matt was just highlighting in terms of management of the database and optimizations. Um, one thing on the previous slide about uh, the um, hardware sizing. Oh, one more? Yeah, go oh, on. oh. going back here. Um, one of the things we see a lot, um, undersized and oversized hardware in the cloud is basically solving your performance issues with increased provisioning. Um, so going back through these slides and hit, hitting um, all those optimizations will help you uh, not do that. Um, we have case studies on our website where we're saving people like half a million dollars in their AWS spend, essentially by just tuning databases and, and properly sizing um, those instances. So um, definitely want to highlight that. I see that all the time with, with customers that I'm speaking with. Is that your last slide? Your bar? Oh, well, see, there's there's actually two more that you didn't talk about in Postgres 14. Actually, there's three more. Well, go ahead. Oh, my gosh. Jeez, didn't even add. But, you, you know, for those using JSON, they changed how you can access JSON from within Postgres, and they made it way more intuitive. So if you haven't taken a look at, you know, how you can access JSON documents directly in Postgres. Postgres 14 added something that is more natural. Um, and so I would encourage you to do that. Um, I also wrote a blog on multi-range data types. So if you're interested in storing ranges within your um, uh, database, so if you wanted to say, you know, the, the classic use case that they always give is you're, you're going to book a room or you're going to book a hotel between this day and this day, and you want to see what days are available, there's now a data type to do that. Um, and you can uh, have it non-contiguous previous to Postgres 14 and had to be contiguous. And I think the other one that was uh, super interesting is the PQLib now allows you to do asynchronous uh, queries. So a lot of times what you'll see in an application is an application will issue a query and then it will wait for the previous query to finish. Then it will execute the next query and then the next, the next, the next. So if you have one query that's a bottleneck, if you don't need those all contiguous in, in a synchronous motion, um, you can use the async option in the PQ, which then you can send all the queries at once. There are there's some downside to that because you're going to send a whole bunch of queries at once and you're going to wait for the response. So you can overwhelm the system, but it is something that is kind of cool if you can make use of it. Now, um, before we go, 
Anybody wearing any Percona swaggy stuff? Got a, got a couple buttons. Oh, we got a couple buttons. So we, we have super secret swag that's only available to those in this room if you're wearing a button or a Percona hat. And we just happen to have buttons and Percona hats up here. So if you want to swing by, we have some super secret swag that we can give you as well as uh, a button and a hat. Um, but that, yeah, I mean, there's, there's some uh, links to some Postgres 14 data, but that is our talk for today. Do we have questions or anything else? Do we have any questions online? So he's he's got the online phone. He's got like the bat phone. Uh, for schema design is a very generic term. Can you provide examples of poor schema design? Um, I think from a poor schema design perspective, I think there's a couple of things, right? So uh, as I mentioned, like data types, but table structures, duplicating data, um, you know, I mentioned using JSON as the default without using any of the built-in features for indexing. That could be another one that's important. Um, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, but choosing the right indexes, choosing the right data types, making sure that your queries are designed uh, in, a, in a proper normalized structure generally is, uh, is good. Uh, they should be. If not, um, I'll post them on, on Twitter and tag it. All right. So if you want some swag, come up. We'll put our masks on so we'll be all safe. Um, we appreciate you guys coming out and hanging out with us. Um, if you haven't stopped by the booth, feel free to do so. This is really hard to get on my head with an elephant. <laughs> I'm just going to say that like this mask thing is difficult with an elephant on your head. So uh, come on up.